Okay. Well, welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm Ann Feldman, the Chief Marketing Officer for Bloomerang, and really, really excited about today's webinar with Val Jones on emergent asking. Get what you need now. A um, couple things. Keep introducing yourself in the chat window, and then also, you know, as we as you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q and A. Um, we're going to have uh, just I'm really excited about I've seen a little bit of Val's content and um, I'm I think you're all going to really enjoy it. So let's just dive in a couple of things I want to do before we we transition over. I'm just going to advance my slides. So we are recording and you will receive a copy of the recording in the slides. You'll get those later today. Again, go ahead and chat in your questions. Um, we'll do our best to answer them. And as we go, sometimes if there's a question that comes in, maybe we'll jump in and answer that along the way. I know Val has a lot of content to cover, so this will be great. Um, and then go ahead and follow along through Twitter, uh, hashtag Bloomerang, uh, Bloomerang Tech. So a couple of other things. So if you're not familiar with Bloomerang, we are a nonprofit donor CRM database. Um, that nonprofits, thousands of nonprofits love to you someday come check us out, but don't do that right now, because what we're going to do is we need your attention right here because there is so much we're going to go through today and learn. And with that, I want to do a little bit of an introduction um, for Val. So I'm going to stop sharing so we can just take a look um, here and just get to know Val a little bit better if you don't know her. Um, Val, you've raised more than 175 million. You've talked to people around the world with fundraising and you've coached more than 5,000 professionals. Um, she's also done things like convinced Mark Cuban of Shark Tank to make an investment in your husband's business. Not only that, like, so accomplished fundraiser, speaker, coach, but also an accomplished author with her book, The Nonprofit Hero. We're going to um, share that at the end. So that if you want to take a look at that, but her book, The Nonprofit Hero has been on the Amazon top 10 hot new releases for nonprofits. So you definitely will want to check that out. Again, don't do that right now. Well, we're going to focus on um, what Val has to share with us. And then she's just an accomplished leader, a uh, number of leadership academies that she's been in. And what I love is um, that you were breaking boundaries as you were a national finalist for a Rhodes Scholarship for when women were first allowed to that was even- a long time ago, guys. <laughs> but thank you, thank you. So um, again, welcome to everybody on and thank you so much for what you're, all of you are doing in terms of helping you know, strengthen the communities that we all live in. Um, your missions, your work is really important. So we're really excited to extend this education opportunity to have Val with us and to share her excellent um, insights and experience. So Val, we want to go ahead and pull up your slides. Again, chat questions as we go. Um, go ahead, go in that, that Q&A panel. We'll, we'll try to answer them. Um, it's going to be a great session. And so I'll turn it over to you. Welcome. Hey guys, thanks so much for coming. I'm really looking forward to sharing this with you. Um, clearly I was a pushy broad from an early age or I wouldn't have been in that Rhodes Scholarship pool. Um, but it's not just me. When I was younger, actually, I did have a lot of trouble asking for anything. So I think the point is right now, emergent asking is a term for asking as you're coming out of the pandemic. So a lot of us have actually, it's not just the kids in school, a lot of us have lost social skills and comfort level with being with other people. So, um, so what we might have been comfortable doing before the pandemic, we might be less comfortable doing now. So maybe you've had this experience I have, like some friend says, oh, let's meet for lunch. And I'm like, great, can we do that by Zoom? <laughs> you know, and I'm an extrovert, so I, I really actually do love being with people, but if you get used to being by yourself for a long time, it can be even more hard, it can be even more difficult to, to ask for help, and yet this is a time when we all need help more than ever. Um, all of our nonprofits, even if we're doing okay, it's a lot more work to get there, and a lot of our people are exhausted, and for-profit sector too. There's just a lot of challenges in managing our lives at this point in time. So on the one hand, 
we're having a harder time masking. And on the other, we need it more. We need help more now than ever. Okay. So let's go over quickly what you're going to learn today. Um, first of all, the five steps of asking, those little five bubbles there. Um, a lot of us, you know, you are subscribing to Bloom Bloomerang, I assume, or at least you're aware of it. So you're probably most of you are in fundraising or at least in the nonprofit sector. So you might be like, oh yeah, when we have an, we want to grow our donor base first, we you know, research, then we cultivate them, then we ask, then we think, and then we engage. But we don't necessarily apply that kind of um, those kinds of steps to our personal life, or at least not, you know, deliberately or intentionally. So we're going we're to walk through how that works in like real life, like for a date, a job, a refund, a place in line, anything. Um, I'm going to go through just a few of the techniques that I've found to be most successful, and um, I'm de I deliberately picked a couple of uh, examples that work for people who are introverted and shy because sometimes they have even more trouble. Um, we're going to go over what an asking personality is and how you can play to your strengths um, and also how to show up ready for yes because a lot of us like we show up and it's like in our mind we're going oh but they're not going to want to do this and I can't believe I'm asking them and maybe this is a bad time blah blah blah. We don't want you playing that recording in your head right we want you show up ready to get yes because how you present when you're asking somebody, whether it's virtually or you know in person, does affect how they respond to you. Okay, so this is where, where we're going to go today, and it shouldn't take too long. So, before we even start with the steps, though, why is why is it so difficult to ask? It shouldn't be for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's good for you as an asker. If you ask for help, it really does help you because especially when people say yes. So, um, but if you don't ask, you definitely lose. So, so I'm gonna just touch on a couple of studies to make this point. So 75% of professionals who asked for a raise got one. They didn't necessarily get all they wanted, but they did get one, but only 43% actually asked for a raise. So if you think about the impact through your career of not asking for a raise all those years, it really can, be, can mount up and be significant. So that's a good reason for you to ask. 78% um, of patients leaving an ER are confused. They're not sure what they're supposed to do when they go out. So obviously if they're not doing the right follow-up treatments or eating the right things or whatever, then they're gonna be less likely to heal. The people who did stop and asked if they were confused, asked for everything, not only in writing, but to be explained until they understood it, um, did, did recover faster. So asking for information can help you recover better in a health situation. Um, and this is my favorite. Uh, it turns out that um, career moms grown sons actually did twice, do twice as much homework. So career moms often were forced to ask their kids to do, to help them with the homework, with their housework more than other you know, parents with more um, at home time might. And so what happened was not only did the kids pitch in, but that behavior continued in their life. So I always say the adult son of a working mom is a great candidate for your future husband, if you're a guy, if you're a woman or a guy. Okay, so we know it's good for the asker and it's also good for the helper. So we forget sometimes that we're animals and we're social animals. Humans would not survive if they hadn't found that they didn't get together and take care of each other and share resources, et cetera. So we are hardwired in our brain to help. So what ha this is what happens to your brain when you make a true act of philanthropy or you really help someone out of the goodness of your heart. Not because your arm's twisted, but it's really like coming from your heart generosity. Um, and I just like to point out that some of these are the same, um, the same hormones that get released when you have an orgasm. So it's, you're really making helpers feel good. But also um, it's, it's a way to reinforce that social behavior that leads to survival. So we really are wired to help other people. So if you're not asking someone, you're not giving them a chance to help you, first of all, and, and they do usually feel good. Think about it for yourself. Like, you know, when my kids were little and Lucy could pick up a toy when she was three for a two-year-old, that's empowering, right? So helping other people is empowering and it helps us feel good. So it's good for us. It's good for the person we're asking. So why is it such a problem? So there, I'm just gonna to touch on some specifics. These are less techniques than like, you know, I have a background in acting. So what's my motivation, right? 
So first of all, when, so I wanna go through sort of the what, who, why we ask. So first of all, deciding what you want is really important. I don't feel good, I want something. What? Well, nobody can help you with that, right? But um, and this year, I, my daughter um, who's grown wanted to go ice skating for her birthday. And I said, oh, great, no problem, January, I go out. Um, I grew up skating in Maine on bogs and lakes and at recess and at home. Um, so I'm thinking, no problem, but I'm 65 now. So boom, I fell down on my back and it really hurt. And I'm like, I can do this, get up, try it again, boom. Three times before the light bulb went off and I thought, you know what? You're a skinny white woman and maybe this is not good for your bones. So it turned out I had cracked my ribs when I fall. So I was stuck at home and after all my friends stopped laughing at me for being such an idiot, um, they, a lot of them said, how can I help? And you know, my first reaction was like, I don't know, just help me. Um, but then thinking about it a little more, I said, you know, um, Don's gonna be out of town Thursday and Friday. It would really help me if you could, you know, bring dinner over. That would be great. So I asked for a very specific thing. So it's much easier for somebody to do that. Like, well, I can't do it Thursday, but maybe I could do it Friday, Val. Great. Is it okay if I do takeout? Because I don't cook myself. Fine. No problem. But if I'm not specific about what I'm asking for, then all my friends are like, well, geez, I offered to help. And she didn't say she needed anything, right? So the more specific you are on what you're asking, the likely you are to get what you want. And then another, another thing is back to the motivation, like decide why you want it. Like if you're not clear on why you want something, why do I want it? Well, you know, let's say it's like, I want a bigger credit card limit. So I'm like putting this off and putting this off. And then I think about like, why do I want a bigger credit card limit? And it turns out, I didn't want a bigger credit card limit. My husband wanted a big credit, bigger credit card limit. I'm like, I'm like the ant and he's the grasshopper. He loves like borrowing money and he's great. He's very successful, he pays it back, but I don't want that. So one of the reasons why I wasn't doing it was because I didn't really want to. That, that My why wasn't strong enough. But if you identify your why and you connect with it, that will help you to be a more effective asker. So you wanna know what you want, you wanna know why you want it, and you wanna know who you should be asking. So towards the end of this talk, we're gonna talk about allies, how you can break projects down into small pieces and figure out who would be really great to help you with you know, larger projects and who's an ally. But the short version is you wanna package the ask or a piece of an ask to be something that this person will say yes to, because what's the point if you know you're going in with somebody who's gonna say no, right? So thinking about who you're at and you might be like, I can't ask anybody but my boss for the raise. Well. Maybe not, but maybe you could ask your friend in HR for some information that would help you make a better ask of that person, of, the, of your boss, right? So thinking about the, 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 um, what you're asking for, why you want it, and then who you're gonna ask um, and looking for people who are gonna say yes. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how you do that. So, and then the next is like, what's the best technique? I'm gonna give you a couple of techniques. Um, this is what a, a really fun non-technique ask looks like. So this, um, this uh, pacifier's name is Phil. As you can tell, he's an elephant. My friend Sharuk has an adorable two-year-old called Armand, and Phil was Armand's absolutely inseparable friend. They could not go in the car without the pacifier Armand. They couldn't go and, and without Phil. They couldn't go anywhere without Phil, and they knew it. So, so um, Sharuk's mom is visiting, and they're in a staple store in um, down in downtown Philadelphia. So, you know, Armand's in the stroller and they're going around and then suddenly Armand starts crying and they're like, what's, what's the matter? And he says, foo, foo. So he lost the pacifier, right? So Armand's thinking like, oh geez, did we leave it in the car? Whatever, I should have brought a duplicate fill. Um, but his mom, who by the way is a physician, but his mom is the grandmother. And she has absolutely no barriers to asking. So she starts grabbing every clerk she can and say, there's, a, there's an elephant pacifier. Have you seen it? Have you seen it? Have you seen it? And then she got everybody so excited. It was like, became this big group project. And I could, you know, he could hear people down the aisle going, Phil, Phil, where are you, Phil? So, 
you know, which is ridiculous, but, um, but her enthusiasm and her need caught fire and got everybody involved. And they did find Phil who had been tossed into a bin with a bunch of like packing supplies or whatever. So sometimes you don't choose the way to ask. The, the choice comes to you. And she had ab she wasn't worried about embarrassing herself. She wasn't worried about anybody saying no. She's just the grandma and she's gonna get her grandson what her grandson wants, right? So, but for most of us, most of the time, um, our need is not so strong and overpowering for what we're asking for. So we're gonna choose different techniques that will work for us, okay? So we're gonna, um, when you're thinking about asking, you're gonna think about what you want, why you want it, who you're gonna ask, and the best way to ask. And I wanna give you a little practice, even though I know we have tons of people in this webinar and some of you watching this as a recording, I'd like you each to take a moment and write something down that someone else in this group might be able to help you with. So maybe not ask for the moon, but if there's a resource or you need a free source of you know, PowerPoint training for one of your staff members or anything that you think somebody in this large group of more than a thousand people might be able to help you with. Okay, I don't want you to ask now, I just want you to write it down. So I'll give you a minute to think about that and we will come back to it at the end. Okay. Hopefully you all have found something that you would like to ask for. If not, what are you doing in this session? <laughs> okay, so let's move on. So the five steps of asking. You may notice that like in fundraising and in some other, you know, in, in you know, sales or business development, you might start with, um, you know, discover research and then asking and then, you know, the other steps. But we're starting with thinking. And you might say, why am I thinking somebody that I haven't even asked something for yet, asked anything of yet? So, well, first of all, because it's the easiest. Most of us were trained, right? Our mothers taught us to send thank you notes. Um, we are grateful, polite people. So thanking is just the easiest thing to do. And if you think about it, there's usually something to thank everybody for. You know, somebody opens the door for you, thank you. You know, somebody um, pitched in and helped you with something in the past, I just wanna thank you again for this. Or I observed you helping this other person. So I just wanna say thank you. I really appreciate you being that kind of person. So first of all, it's easy. Second of all, it's a competitive advantage to thank people. Um, I don't know if this happens to you, but when I'm doing searches for staff, um, if somebody writes a thank you note, they automatically go up the list, right? So people might have equal qualifications. If they never say a thank you, send a thank you for an interview, a follow-up thank you, then you know I know they're not gonna be as good in this field as they would if they wrote a thank you note and it was a thoughtful thank you note. So first of all, it's the easiest part to just thank people. Second of all, it's an advantage, a competitive advantage that it gives you. And third, um, people are twice as likely to help again if they've been thanked after they help once. So you might think of this as like, you know, seeding the ground with future opportunities for help. Um, there was a study done that I like um, where they, you know, psychologists, what are they doing? They're spending their whole life like doing these weird studies on people. But anyway, um, so they did a study that in um, graduate school. And so they had certain graduate students and they were to ask the, the professors for help with something, you know, something with their thesis or whatever. So they tracked what happened. And the people who asked were much more likely to get help. And interesting, when those same professors were asked again by somebody else even, they were twice as likely to help that other person as they were before they were asked at all. So helping sort of begets helping. Um, and if you think about it, when I've helped somebody once, it's a little easier for me to help them again. So thanking somebody and reminding them that they helped you is not a bad thing at all. And it does help to encourage that part of our social behavior, because remember we're social animals. Okay, so step one is thank. Step two is engage. Um, so you wouldn't you know, ask somebody for a gift if you hadn't like spent time getting to know them a little bit, 
Um, this is, you know, we have at least one state of Mainer in the audience. Um, and I'm from Maine. My brother, Chris, was the agronomist for the state of Maine. Now he volunteers for the Orono Bog Walk. Um, and so, so a bog is like a swamp, right? So um, he had a couple of friends that he wanted to help with the walk, which meant like taking some of the wood apart and then putting in new wood, et cetera. Not an incredibly fun and sexy job. So, but he knew that some of them were botanists. So he took them on a walk just when there were some beautiful flowers, some really interesting, um, you know, mushrooms and things like that. So they had a great walk first. And then he said, so guys, wasn't this great? Would you be willing to help me next Saturday to put together this walk? And, you know, some of them grumbled, but most of them did it. And then uh, two of them, he did it with like four or five of his friends, I think two of them actually volunteered and they ended up working in the winter as well as in the summer, which if you know Maine winters is quite an accomplishment, but he wasn't gonna just ask them cold, right? He wanted to engage them first and see if they were even interested in the bog or in the flowers or what you might see there, okay? So first we wanna thank people. He thanked them for their past support in his career, which was valid. And then he took them on a walk to engage them. And obviously if somebody decides not to go on the bog walk, maybe they just don't care about it and don't focus on them, focus on the people that are interested. So by engage, what I mean is give them some experience or cultivation before you expect them to do something for you. Okay. so. <laughs> There's enough people in the audience that perhaps one of you shares my experience as the mom or parent of someone who's on the spectrum. So uh, my daughter, Lucy, is brilliant. She's an environmental activist. She's an artist. She's a lot of great things. She's also has um, Asperger's syndrome. She's on the spectrum. So I have spent years and years getting almost every benefit that I was able to get for her often against a lot of frustrating opposition. Um, for example, once I went into, we had spent like six months working with a benefits counselor to set up a, a meeting with a judge who was to determine whether Lucy um, would be entitled to a certain kind of benefits or not. So we were all prepared. We've been working on it for months. We went to the meeting, the judge did not show up. And I had a witness because I, I made sure the benefits counselor went with me. We got a letter later saying that Lucy was being denied benefits because Lucy didn't show up. And this didn't happen once, it happened twice. The same thing with a different judge who also didn't show up. So if you imagine that times 100 times 14 years of advocacy, then you have some idea of how you know, how much of a warrior mom I tend to be when it comes to getting benefits or resources or opportunities for my daughter. So I'm all girded up. So I was scheduled to have one of these meetings. I had been working on something for about six months and I was gonna be meeting with the person from the Department of Human Services who was gonna make the decision. And I was like armored up and ready to go. But thankfully I stopped. And about 15 minutes before I was gonna meet this guy, um, I looked him up on LinkedIn. And it turned out that the guy I was gonna be speaking with had won all kinds of like customer service awards with the Department of Human Services. I didn't even know they did that, but he was like top of his class for that in our whole county. Um, and he had, you know, citations and all kinds of compliments and stuff. So clearly this guy was not necessarily the enemy. So I kind of ramped down my frustration a little bit and we had a great conversation. Um, Lucy did get the benefits. I'm not saying that that me ramping down made the difference, but what's the first thing when somebody comes and hits you, right? The first thing you do is like hit that, like you push me, I'll push you back. So by stopping and doing some research or observing someone so that you know you're engaged, you're engaging with the real person rather than engaging with your idea of what that person is or what you've already decided that they're gonna say, okay? So take a minute, if you can, to research or watching body language or whatever, so that you're bringing your, the best self to meet that person to the table. Okay? So first think, second engage, third, do some discovery. Okay, so the fourth one is the one we get stuck at. Um, it's asking, and uh, these are, I wanna talk about the yeah buts, which is, yeah, I'd like to ask for a raise, but no, you know, 
nobody's going to get it one or I'm not going to know what to say or whatever. Most of those objections are fear based. Like, yeah, I'd like to, but, you know, I'm going to put my friend in a socially awkward position or they're going to say no. So why should I ask? I'm afraid they're going to say no. I'm afraid I'm going to put, but you don't actually know, right? Back to my situation with the social worker, you don't know what's going to happen. So I'd like you to think about something that you want to ask for right now. And by the way, Anne is monitoring the, the Q&A, I hope, yeah. because- I am, unless, I'm monitoring, we're good. We'll take Q&A at the end, because- Yeah, you're, we'll take it at the end, but like- flow. Lots Anne of good will, questions. Anne, if somebody says, I can't see you, the camera's off, then hopefully you're right, Anne, and Anne will straighten it out. Anyway, so um, we're going to run a poll in a minute, and I would just like you to respond. Like, so think of the thing that you want to ask for. Like, imagine yourself asking for it see the person, think about what you want, why you want it, and then identify the yeah, but that comes up. Like what, yeah, but. So we're gonna run the poll now, and I'd like you to pick from some of the most common yeah, buts or other. So you're gonna ask for this thing, what's your yeah, but? Is it, I'm afraid they'll say no? Is it, I'm afraid they won't like me anymore if I ask them for this? Is it, I'm afraid, it'll be uncomfortable? Is it, I'm afraid I won't not know what to say? Or uh, I'm afraid I'll ask and they won't be able to help. So what was the point? Or is it something else? So I'll give you a few minutes to, to go through, think about this. Yep, I'm kind of watching, uh, we're getting there and watching the count here. A lot of good responses across the entire spectrum here. So let's see. Give everybody a couple more seconds to answer. Okay, I'll give you one more second to answer, get your response in. I see a few more ticking up here. It's, it's still climbing. <laughs> We've got a lot of people on, so make sure you uh, answer. All right, I think we can, let's go ahead and, okay, get your answer in. We're gonna go ahead and end the poll. Okay, we hold it, hold it. Don't end okay. the poll, if you could just hold it up for a minute. So yeah. here's the good news, guys. For those of you who, for any of these, whether you're afraid they're gonna say no, they wouldn't like you, it'd be uncomfortable, Whatever you're asking fear is, the flip side of that is you're asking strength. So, and we'll talk about asking for strength. So for example, for the people who said it will be uncomfortable, you probably have really good social skills. So, you know, you are capable of finding a time and a place where it would be comfortable, especially if you think of the what, the why, the how you're gonna be asking. Um, for the people who said no, as they're asking fear, that's their fear. You're probably pretty competitive and pretty accomplished. Um, so you will find a way. So you're asking strength is like, yes, you're afraid, but you're smart and you're strategic. So you'll tend to think through, play it out. Why would they say no? Well, if they said no for this reason, I do that. If they said no for this reason, I, I do that because your motivation is pretty strong for getting what you want. Um, they won't like me. They're afraid, you're afraid they won't like you if you ask for something that's similar to the social skills. Um, I won't know what to say. So the flip side of the asking fear, I won't know what to say for many people, they're asking strength is their data processors. They're really good at um, absorbing and interpreting information. They're not comfortable asking unless they have the charts and graphs and the information that supports the ask that they're going to make. So um, what I love about these people, by the way, is they're great board solicitors because they don't make stuff up on the fly. They just like go with the script and they're good with that. But um, for, for you, for the people who don't know what to say, writing a script in advance and thinking through what you want to say so that it's logical and you feel like you have support for that, you know, concrete data that supports it um, will make you a very strong asker and you'll be more comfortable with that too. 
So if we have time at the end, I want to look at some of the others because I'm always fascinated by them. These are do tend to be some of the most common fears or yabats. So, so keep in mind this flip side where you're asking fear is you're asking strength when we get to the part about asking personalities. So if we can proceed. Okay. Do you want me to share the, the polling results so you can see what everybody for the audience to see? The data. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. Okay. I thought you guys were yeah, all looking here, at it. Let me just for yes. everyone to see where, where, where all right. of us kind of how we netted out. Um, so you should be able to see the data. See how many of you said no. How many said they won't like me? Just to get a sense of the group the group here today. And by the way, all of these are valid fears. The point is just to acknowledge them, and rather than stuffing it down and going like, I know this is going to be uncomfortable, but I'm going to ask anyway. To like acknowledge that, get comfortable with it and, and use your, your strength to, to ask, you know, given that that's your concern. Okay. Right. Okay. I'll stop sharing the results and we'll keep going. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So what's next? guys, I'm trying to move the slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, so a couple of simple techniques that are easy to remember. Um, technique one um, sort of ties to those people that are, are the data processors and also concerned about social um, situations, but it works for everybody. So this is what I call due diligence. So when I was first a development director and I had a big staff and I was in my thirties and very full of myself, um, I thought I could solve everybody's problems. And so I had a line outside of my door, everybody asking like, should we do this? Should we do this? What are we gonna do with this? And after, you know, I mean, I'm not very smart. So after about three weeks, I went, oh, this is not a good idea. I am doing all the thinking for them. They're capable of thinking for themselves. So um, I sort of jokingly, but also really, put a form, forms on my office door, because it was hard copy then, and it had a list of questions. So the first question was, um, you know, what is the problem you want to speak to me about? Define it more specifically. What would be three possible solutions to this problem? One, two, three. In your opinion, which of those three is the best solution? And then the next question was, do you still need to talk to me? because that's all they needed to do. So, but I did want them not to be lazy and to do, and not to be dependent on me for God's sakes, um, cause we're all smarter together than we are individually. So I wanted them to do their due diligence. So before you ask something to think that through and you can use my cheat list if, list if you want, but to just think through what you might think is a solution. Because if you think about it, every, every, every executive I know would rather staff come to them with solutions than problems. And the same thing is true in your personal life. You know, do you, want to, do you want your friends to come to you saying, I can't do this? Or do you want them to say, you know, I want to do this. I can't do it because this, boom, boom, boom. Could you help me with this one piece, right? It's much easier for you to help. So just doing your homework and thinking through the ask before you make it is technique number one. Technique number two, this is great for calm, shy people. It's called the broken record method of negotiation. Some of you may know this already because it's pretty common in sales, but I love it because um, it doesn't require a lot of intelligence or skill. You just have to say the same thing over and over again. So an example is um, I was using some software, not Bloomerang, for my work. And I'd been subscribing to this software for like 20 years for my company and something wasn't working. I was really disappointed. And I also decided at that point when I looked at some options, I didn't want to continue with that. I had already paid for a year's subscription. It was only like a month after I did that. So contacted them. I said, I, I want to eliminate my contract and I want my money back. So I got a no and then I said, I still want this. And then I got bumped to a uh, you know, customer service person. That was a meeting the next week. That was a live meeting. I explained again, I said, I'm a loyal client. You've made a lot of money off me. I know I signed a contract for a year, but I want my money back because of this, this, and this. And they were like, no, it's, you really, we can't do that. I'm really sorry. And I said, good, ask your supervisor and what's your supervisor's name. And of course they didn't give it to me. So she said she would. And then she got back to me the next week and said, oh, I'm terribly sorry. I did talk to my supervisor and that didn't work. 
So then I used my, my um, beware guys, don't ever, like if I ask you for something, it's just easier to give it to me. So I looked at who some of the higher level um, contacts I had uh, at, the, at the firm might be. I explained the situation. I told them how much money they made off me. And um, this week, so the process started in February. This week, I got a credit for $1,000, which I can either use or my next call is gonna be to get the cash. So anyway, the point is, I didn't come up with any different reasons along the way. And I didn't start with the right person either, but I just kept asking over and over and over again until I get what I want. So that can be the same for you. Most people, like if you think about it, some, it's like with kids, like they, mom, I want this, go away. Mom, I want this, no, no. Mom, I want this, I'm going into a meeting, I'm gonna give a talk for a blue meringue. Here, take it. You know, so most, many times, if you're calm and patient, and polite, and you just keep presenting the request over and over again, it's just easier for people to give you what you want than it is to keep saying no and keep dealing with you. So one technique is due diligence. Another is the broken record method of negotiation. Okay, so technique number three is a shared goal, helping people to realize that you're working towards a shared goal. And um, so a shared goal might be, uh, you know, we're working on this project together and we both want this to go well because we know that the boss is watching and depending on how well it goes, we might all get a raise or whatever it is that you're trying to do. We might be able to accomplish something. We're gonna get better technology support, whatever. Um, so this is an example with me and my daughter, Lucy, when she was much younger. Um, so I, I'm like, you guys, I was working like crazy hours, 60 to 80 hours a week with two little kids and, um, but I you know, wanted to do a garden. As I mentioned, I grew up in Maine, like farming and gardening is important to me. So Lucy and I, we carved out time to do a garden together. So we're gonna like pull up the weeds and put in these baby plants and grow tomatoes and stuff. Great, so I'm there, we're at the garden. I explained to Lucy what she has to do. I'm trundling over to the composter to dump some weeds that I've already pulled. Do that, I come back and Lucy's just kind of standing there. Now, Lucy's brilliant, but she's also a little bit of a space shot. Doesn't fall far from the tree. Um, so it's like, Luce, do you remember what we're here for? Yes, mom. So what are we doing? We're making a garden. Okay, so you're gonna pull the weeds? And she just looked at me. So I was like, okay, I'm pulling some more weeds. I take them over, I come back. And she's still standing there and she's looking upset. So it's like, oh, you know, Lucy, we said we would do this. We would said we would do this together. I only have another 45 minutes for my quality time with my daughter, you know, what's up? And she looked at me and she said, I don't want to do it, mom. And in the, in the conflict part went like Richard, my husband went by and he said, it was really funny because it was like, Baz like looking down like this and Lucy looking up like this. And it was like a mirror image of these two indomitable, you know, stubborn females. So anyway, I said, okay, Let's just take a minute. First of all, do you really want to do the garden? Yes, mom. I do want to do a garden with you. Okay. Do you want to do the garden? Is it, um, do you understand that you need to remove the, the weeds and put them over here so that we can put the new plants in? And she said, no. I said, well, what's the matter? She said, mom, I don't want to kill the baby plants which totally makes sense, right? To her, there was no difference between the baby plants that were weeds and the baby plants that were tomato plants that we were, that we were planting and she didn't want to kill the baby weeds. So I said, oh, okay. I said, okay, so we both want to do the garden. I understand why you would not want to do that. So, um, but do you understand also, Lucy, that two things cannot occupy the same space. Like when you're in line at school, you can't be occupying the same space as Sarah. And she's like, yes, mom, I understand that two things cannot occupy the same space. I'm like, great. Okay, so I understand where you're coming from. Two things cannot occupy the same space. We do wanna do this garden together. So here's what I'm gonna suggest. How about if we pull up the baby weeds and we plant them in back of the composter and we take these little plants and we put them and we grow tomatoes with them. And she said, that would be fine. So I asked, but so this, that's what we call resistance in the four Ps. So 
first of all, you want to establish, is it in somebody's interest? Is it their priority? Because if Lucy didn't want to do a garden like me, I could ask her, I was blue in the face and nothing would happen. So when you're, you know, you're all at some point when you're asking for things, you're going to get a pushback, right? Whatever it is, like when you ask for something, sometimes other people's first reaction is like, no, because what, what are you asking for? Like they need to give themselves a little protection or space. So the first thing is to determine that it's in their, both in your, in your interest and in their interest and in your interest. If that's the case, then there's something called drop the rope. So if any of you have ever played, you know, tug of war, we have one line of kids on one side and the other. Well, if you drop the rope, suddenly there's no more resistance. I mean, they might fall over backwards, but there's nothing for them to fight with. So the pressure for me to like just drop the rope rather than insisting that we do it and we do it my way to drop the rope allowed Lucy to sort of go, okay, now I'm not defending myself against mom's push, you know, but first it's in the best interest. We share that interest. Second, we drop the rope. I'm not making, I want to understand. And then the next thing I did was what's their perspective? You know, I, I did have to ask, I had no idea she was thinking, oh, I'm killing baby plants. Um, but once I understood, I could say, yes, that is true. I can, you know, I can absolutely see why that would be that way for you. So many people want to be validated, right? Like we want to be understood. We want somebody to say, yes, Val, I see why you're upset about that, you know? So just understanding and validating the other person's point of view will help you to move forward better. And then um, using the fourth P as a principle, which is what is the undeniable truth? Because getting somebody to say yes once is very helpful to getting them to say yes again. So the undeniable truth was that two things could not occupy the same space, right? So I know this is a very simple example, but um, it's the four Ps of priority because if it's not their priority, they're not gonna do it. If you're pressuring people, most of the time they don't wanna say yes, they just wanna pressure back. Perspective, if you don't understand where they're coming from, how are you gonna have a fruitful conversation, right? And then principle, like finding something that's an undeniable truth that you can both agree on is very helpful to finding a plan like, well, we agree on this, so let's move forward. So anyway, that's resistance in the four Ps. So let's go to step number five. So when people are asking, you know, obviously we get anxious sometimes, but the good news is there's really only three answers. Yes, no, or maybe, or maybe, or an alternate um, opportunity. So, um, so what I do is go back to thinking, you know, there are gonna be a lot of opportunities for people to say yes, but you still wanna wait. Ask, have them say yes, and then wait, because sometimes there's more to say, right? You don't wanna talk over them right away. So yes, and I can't do it now, but I could do it Thursday. Yes, and let me write the check right now. Yes, just yes, okay? So the first thing you wanna do is wait. Thank you so much, I really appreciate that. I just want to repeat this to make sure I've got it right. You said, yes, you would deliver the dinner on Thursday. Is that right? Because that gives them an opportunity to say, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. no, actually you misunderstood me. Um, so we play back. So wait to let them finish, say thank you, play back, and then talk about next steps. Great. I will send you an email to remind you that you're going to bring dinner over next Thursday and I really appreciate it. Okay. No is the one we're scared of saying, but sometimes a no is, you, that's the one we tend to talk over. If somebody says no, you might let, just stop and let them, give them some space. It's like, no, can't do it Thursday. But if you still need it on Sunday, I could do it. Or no, I can't do that. Wouldn't it be easier if I just gave you the money? Or no, I can't do that because my boss, but I can forward it up to my boss. So you see like giving someone to take, give them a chance to do the no. And if it's a no, it's a no. So in all cases, just wait, let them finish their thought. You don't know what they're gonna say. Wait, thank them for responding and giving you that information, say it back. So what I understand is you're saying that you can't do it and you know, but you would like to, great, thanks. Oh no, you're saying actually you don't wanna do it because your car is out of gas, whatever, you know, so that's a no. Um, so repeating back is, people a chance to correct what you may have heard or thought you heard, okay? Thank them for even being willing to listen to your request, okay? 
that sets you up for a more comfortable ask the next time. And then maybe it's like, wait for them to finish, thank them for their response, repeat back to make sure you understand. So you're saying maybe, and then explore because you need to talk to your husband first, or maybe because you're not sure you're gonna be free, but you need to check your calendar, right? Or maybe you can't do that, but you'd be happy to do something else. That's the alternate, right? So the good news is it's just yes, no, or maybe, or alternative, those are the only possible answers you're gonna get. And the system is pretty much the same, whatever. If they say no, it's like, thanks for even listening to this. If they say maybe and said like, okay, I understand you're gonna do this and that might help you make up your mind or whatever. And then you'll get back to me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So that, do you see how each, whatever the answer is, it's not so scary, okay? Um, so just thank them and, and particularly agree on next steps because what happens to me sometimes is people ask me something, I'll say, oh yeah, sure, I'll give you a reference. And then I go on with my life and they're like a month later going, well, you didn't give me a reference. I'm like, oh, I thought the person was gonna call me from the job, your potential employer. Did you want me to do a written reference? Okay, so always like playing back that next step. Okay, so this is sort of the fun, easy part. Um, and I will just do a quick disclaimer about uh, Myers-Briggs. Um, there's, you know, you've all probably taken Myers-Briggs or the big five, or there's a lot of personality tests in the work. Um, the point I wanna make here is that people, introverts do tend to ask differently than extroverts. Analytical people do tend to ask differently than intuitive people. And the point I wanna make here is that Gallup poll studies have proven that training someone to build on their strengths is 12 times more effective than training them by trying to fix their weaknesses, right? So that's why I'm trying to do. like, you know, why focus on your weaknesses, which, you know, makes you wonder why we give kids a hard time on, we focus on the F instead of the A's on our report cards. But anyway, I want you to play to your strengths. And um, so, the Myers-Briggs is the example I'm using. There's four continuums, extroverted to introverted. And it's really where you get your energy, right? That one, sensing versus intuiting, thinking versus feeling. It's not like, so I'm sort of on the middle in the thinking feeling continuum, but I'm like way over on the extroverted side. It doesn't mean that I don't feel things. It just means that I tend to, I'm an ENTJ. I tend to lead with my mind first and my feelings afterwards. And how you deal with the world, the judging versus perceiving. Judging is like, it's not judging like judgy, it's judging like I'm, I'm good at making decisions. I'm gonna figure out what it is, I'm gonna make a judgment call and then we go for it. Perceiving people often are like, wait, there's more information out there. I'm not gonna make a decision until I have all the information, okay? So there's a little link here, you can copy it out and you'll get the thing. So you can look up your Myers-Briggs if you don't already know it and you can send it to me and I'll send you your asking personality. But I want to walk you through an example. Um, so this is my friend, Lisa. Um, she's an INFJ. It's actually the rarest type overall. So you might ask, why am I using this example? Because it actually happens to be the most common type among fundraisers. So I figured, again, if it's Bloomerang, a lot of you might be um, fundraisers and so might be one of your types, a type for a lot of you. So what's the what, who, why that you're going to be most comfortable with? Right? So if we look at Lisa, who's the INFJ, and I know this is small and you will get this afterwards. So if you're an ENTJ in the bright yellow, lower right hand corner and you're incredibly competitive, don't worry, you'll get the information. Anyway, but for, for Lisa, the what? It has to be motivational. She has to think that the person she's asking is like, it's gonna, it's gonna motivate them to do better. And she wants that for everybody. Um, who they want to, she wants to find somebody who's that really has that interest. She's not going to ask a lot of people that are not interested in something in the hopes of hitting somebody who will. Um, the way she likes to ask is by facilitating conversations. And I'll show you how that works. Um, so that's her what, who, why. Um, all of us have strengths and weaknesses, and you can see them here. Um, INFJs, by the way, tend to be the most contemplative of the groups. Um, and so her strength is she's really good at guiding the helper. So when she asks somebody to help her, she like stays with them while they're helping them. She tries to, she wants to make them successful in, even when they're helping her. And then the weakness is sometimes she cares so much about other people that she won't ask at all. 
So let's put it together for Lisa. Lisa's an INFJ. The what has got to be motivational. She's not just going to do it for money or for something else. It's got to be like truly something that would improve somebody's life. Um, who she wants to do, talk to people who are truly interested in helping on this in this way, whatever it is, not the people or not. Um, how she does it is she facilitates it because she's an introvert and intuitive. She's an excellent li listener. The weakness is she might not ask at all. So if Lisa's my friend, how do I help her? Um, and I'm going to use a fundraising example in this case where Lisa was on the, as a therapist and she's on the board of an organization that helps traumatize children who've been physically abused in their home and they're now in, in you know, uh, public care. So um, she really wanted to raise money for this group and she really wanted help, but she was terrified of fundraising. So we talked about it for a while and um, I had, we set up a meeting with the executive director of her organization and a donor who she knew and a lot of other people didn't. And she'd been talking about this organization to her friend, the potential donor for a while. And um, I said, your job is just to facilitate the conversation. So she did. So the executive director was coming on a little bit strong. She was like, wait, 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 I want to hear what my friend has to say. So she was really intuitive. She was good at like sensing where there might be a hesitation and asking the person to explain what their hesitation was, et cetera. And, you know, sort of channeling the, the um, executive director along the lines that might be most fruitful for the combination and conversation. And they got a $10,000 gift first time. And afterwards, Lisa was like, oh, that was great. And she said, is that fundraising? I'm like, yeah, that's fundraising for you. So think about ways that you can ask that are more aligned with your personality. And we don't have time to go into all of them, but I will. I am happy to send each and every one of you your own two-page in-depth asking personality profile that suggests like the techniques and what, what you could do at different steps in the asking process. Um, all I need is for you to send me your you know, if you have your Myers-Briggs or your Jungian personality, those four letters, and I gave you the link earlier, okay? So the idea is play to your strengths, okay? And then the last thing I wanna talk about is, um, is working with your allies, showing up ready for yes, right? Okay, so one thing, and this is a checklist, feel free to print it out and use it, um, but it's helpful for a lot of people to break it down, right? So let's say there's a project at work and you're swamped and you need help. It is often easier to get people to help you if you can break it down. So first you wanna describe the project to yourself, just like I did the thing on the door. Um, and then think about, have I done something like this before? If so, what can I do or what, what do I want to? Like what's the fun part for me or what am I particularly good at? And then you take the plump stuff for you or the stuff that's fun for you. And then what's left that needs to be done? You know, maybe there's like, well, this needs to be done, this needs to be done, this needs to be done. And then think about who's good at this or has done it before, or maybe there's someone more junior to you that hasn't done this, but wants to be able to learn that skill. So put the names together. So you've got what you wanna do, the piece you're gonna take. You've got the elements that you want help with. You've got a list of names of people that either are good at this, particularly good at this, like it, or have experience or might wanna get experience. And so then you can look at them and match, like if number one maybe goes with your number three person or whatever. But can you see if you like break it down, it's much easier to say, you know, um, and you're really good at running PowerPoints and I need somebody to do a practice with me before I go to that big conference. Would well, you be willing to give me 20 minutes like sometime in the next three days to do that? Because you're really good at that. And then somebody, do you see what I mean? So like asking people to help with things that they're good at or they might want to learn is really help. Is, it sets you up to get a yes. Um, so sometimes people make fun of, uh, of um, visualization. All I know is this young woman, she's the youngest woman ever to win the um, US Open. One of the ways she did it was by visualizing her succeeding at that every day from when she was about 12 years old. And at, when she was 12, she wrote a check for herself from the US Open for $6 million because she was visualizing the win winning. And, um, you know, there's, you know, breathe, just take a minute to think, check in on yourself, see how you're doing, um, and then play out the scene successfully. And um, it really does make a difference. And by the way, if you think you don't know how to visualize, you're doing it already because it's called worrying. 
right? You do negative visualization all the time. Like, oh my gosh, I'm in the car, I'm running late, I'm not gonna make it on time. So you're setting yourself up for you know, failure all the time because you're visualizing failure. If instead you say you get in the car, it's like, it's gonna be fine. You know, worst case scenario, I'm a few minutes late, but hey, it's COVID, there's not as many people on the road. It'll give me time to think about this. The you that shows up is gonna be much more ready for yes than the you that was worrying and visualizing failure, okay? And then quickly strengthen your voice. Remember I said we are social animals. So we send signals as to whether we're dominant or subordinate. Wolves do this, even if the wolf who's dominant is not the strongest wolf, which they often aren't. They've established that earlier that they're dominant and that dominance continues. But people who start a request with please, and sorry, like, I'm so sorry to ask you, or can you please do that? Especially if they're, you know, it's somebody's job and you're the boss and you're asking them to do it. If you start by apologizing, that's not a very strong position to be asking from. So asking clearly without and unapologetically for what you need is more likely to get you a yes, okay? And then fine tuning your approach is pretty helpful too. And I'm only gonna give a couple of examples, but the first one is the asking medium can change the response by 30%. And the example I'll give you is that, um, so when a parent does, when they had surveys where parents were supposed to ask their kids if they had sexual experiences and were they experiencing any STDs, okay? Same, same group. They had the kids sit with a private tablet in the doctor's office to provide that information which went confidentially to the doctor and their parents never needed to know. Well, guess what? You got a better return on asking. The confidential one on the tablet, right? Who wants to tell their parents they had sex? Who wants to even think about that? So think about the medium that you're communicating and what might be more likely to get a yes. And then timing, my brother taught, my, one of my brothers taught me this really early on. It was like, my mom was really frustrated. She was trying to do something in the kitchen. We come in from for a snack, and I was like, "I want to ask for cookies." And my brother's answer was, "Not now." <laughs> so, at the end of a day, when people are tired, not always the best time to ask, right? If they're struggling, maybe not the best time to ask. If they're fresh and you just had a great experience, maybe that's a better time. Okay, so fine tune your approach a little bit, and then the virtual asking tips I'll just suggest, which I think you know most of these from a lifetime in Zoom the last couple of years um, is first of all, you can edit your email, right? So if you're one of those who puts please and sorry in your email, before you send it, stop and cut out the apologies, right? And just ask for what you want because write, you can do that in writing. Um, so you can get out all your anxieties first and then you can edit it and get rid of them. Um, and whether it's Zoom or on the phone, I'm actually standing now. I don't know if you can tell, but I have a lot more energy when I'm standing and giving a talk. When I do in real life talks, I'm standing, I'm not sitting down. So if you stand, whether it's on the phone or a Zoom, you generally have more energy, right? Also, if you're shy, having a script for what you wanna say in advance, just a few bullets, if you're gonna ask and you're uncomfortable about that, will give you more confidence, right? You're never gonna read it exactly, but just knowing what you're gonna say and having a script is really helpful. And the other thing is, even if it's not on Zoom, and it's just either phone or even an email, if you smile when you're asking, you're more likely to get a yes. So those are some really quick and dirty tips on that. Um, for the favor bank, um, I think we're running a little short on time, but is there anybody who's willing to put one answer in, one thing they wanted that we might be able to get somebody to answer and then open questions? I Sorry. I I think we have actually the um, early on people uh, were posting. So let's see, somebody uh, be brave and put your ask back in the chat because we've got a lot, a lot of great conversations going on in, in the sorry, community. Too much. community. It's oh, great. I'm sorry, never mind. <laughs> sample uh, giving policies. That's the ask. Okay. So sample giving policies. Somebody wants to connect on LinkedIn. Is that something that anybody who volunteers could send you an email afterwards, Anne, and have that shared? Yes. I mean, if you want to connect with different people on LinkedIn, I know you've been helping each other out as we've been uh, talking today. So again, there's a great sense of community here with everybody uh, on the webinar. Um, 
and how to build monthly funders. So does anybody know if anybody knows how to build monthly funders? If you could shoot a, a tip or an article that you've read, or even a sample of a program that you're really proud of, because yeah. I know a lot of us have done this. Tips for new fundraisers. Mm -hmm. Julie, I bet there's a bunch of people that could give you some tips, including signing up for your local AFP chapter if you can get your organization. Well, we've got a link LinkedIn in there. Thanks, yeah. Manny. Okay. So while we're we're so doing the point that, is keep on going, but the point is look at all the people that were willing to help. Right? Like all you guys did was put in a chat of a Zoom that you wanted something, and all these people are happy to help you. And if you connect with some of them afterwards and anybody who wants to share that, maybe send it to Anne, then um, I'm sure they can help you offline as well. But it helps to ask. Absolutely. Um, well, let's just do one quick, hopefully maybe this is not too quick, but a, a question that Ellen uh, posted of, uh, how deeply do I need to know a donor's likes, dislikes, passions before making an ask? Uh, she continues and says, I was taught we always need to align and ask with the donor's personal passions, but in her case, their org has specific needs. And so it's that kind of that balancing of, you know, how much to know the donor versus what we need. Yeah. Um, so so that's I would say two, two words, curiosity and empathy. Like, start, don't ask, start by asking, ask them what they're interested in. Right. Tell them that. How did you get involved? I'm new. How did you get involved with this organization? What led you to this? What do you like? What do you not like? People will tell you what they care about. And then being empathetic is just putting yourself in their place. If they're everything they say is not what you're asking for, you could, you know, be honest with them and say, geez, you know, it sounds like you're not so interested in this, but we have these other things that could use your help. Could we have a conversation about that or or, you know, I would like to ask you for this. How would you feel about that? Right? You never go wrong with empathy. So just putting yourself in the other person's place, I find works really well. That's great. Let's see here. Well, I think we're running short on time. I want to just, if you can stop sharing, I'll, I want to pop up a couple of things to get your contact info up on the screen for everybody, Val. And, um, and then also, while we're doing that here, let me just share. Here we go. So contact info for Val. This was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, really good information. There's a couple other highlights, though. So I did post in the chat earlier, if you caught it, um, the, the link to the Myers-Briggs assessment, the personality quiz, as well as um, Val's info. But there it is again to send send your uh, your, your personality type. And then uh, just a little bit on Val's book for, for the nonprofit hero, just fantastic information. I, there were so many great insights um, of flipping the yeah, but uh, I love that. So, you know, lots of great tips. So Val, thank you so much. And well, also, and then also to everybody on the webinar for your engagement, your participation, keep going. Let's keep the conversation going. Keep doing what you're doing. You're out there doing amazing work. I know it, it has been exhausting. I was just at AFP this week and talked to a lot of people. Um, but kind of the phrase was, we got to keep going. We have so much more to do. But remember to take care of yourself and remember to stay safe. And it's things like this that would, our creativity can get spurred. So Val, thanks again for your participation. And then next week, just a little kind of tip is Rachel Muir, Muir is going to be on about getting more gifts from your email subscribers. So um, lots of great content coming. Again, thank you everybody for attending. And, and just yes. one closing, when you send out the, the PowerPoint in the recording, can you send out the chat too so people can see some of the answers? Yep. To I'll, I'll work with our team on seeing how we can uh, get the chat and keep it really easy for all of you to connect with one another. So and thank you so much for helping each other. Yes, very much so. Have a fabulous rest of your day. Take care. Bye. Bye.